our next speaker is also a very distinguished guest. Uh, she has, uh, that's Vinita Bali. She is the chair of the board uh, of the Global Alliance for Improved Nutrition in Bangalore in India. Uh, and you don't end up in such a position just by um, chance. Uh, she is a global business leader and she has had uh, extensive experience in leading large companies, both in India and overseas. Uh, she has, uh, as a consequence of her great achievements as a business leader, she has been chosen among 27 global leaders to, uh, from, uh, she has been appointed by the UN uh, to help improve maternal and child health as a part of its Scaling Up Nutrition Initiative. She has been recognized in forums nationally and internationally and has won several awards for her various contribu contributions to business. And we can for, uh, say that she is uh, an inspiration for many, many, many people. So we are very delighted to have you here and to tell us about how uh, marine fish resources as a source for food proteins can be important in a global perspective. So please. Thank you very much for that introduction. Good morning, Your Royal Highnesses, ladies and gentlemen. First of all, my gratitude and thanks to Firminish and uh, uh, Legacy for this wonderful conference and an opportunity to really talk about issues that concern us. I probably am the only person who is not qualified either as a scientist or as, um, you know, as a nutritionist, but having spent a lot of time dealing with the food industry and currently in my role as the global chair of uh, GAIN, which is the Global Alliance for Improved Nutrition, which was created in 2002 by the UN to really address the multifaceted and multidimensional problems of malnutrition and undernutrition. So over the next about hour or so, and I hope we will have time for questions, I'm really going to talk to you about the larger perspective on undernutrition and malnutrition so that the work that comes out of this conference and out of conferences like this begins to be aligned to the problems that the world is facing when it comes to undernutrition and malnutrition. So without looking at any slides, you know, I just want us to remember one fact which to me was startling when I first heard it. Of the seven billion people who live in this world, three billion are malnourished. And the world today is dealing with the double burden of malnutrition. On the one hand, people who are obese and have enough calories but are malnourished. And on the other hand, people who sleep hungry every night. And there are about 800 million of those living today out of the seven billion people who simply don't get either the in enough calories or enough micronutrients. And the magnitude of the problem that we are then talking about is a function of how do we, as citizens of this planet, as people who believe we are responsible to improve the quality of life of every person on this planet, what is the role that we can play, whether it is in terms of harnessing the resources of the sea, whether it is in terms of responsible agricultural practices, or whether it is in terms of not wasting the food that is produced. Actually, there is an interesting statistic on food in the developing countries. 30% of food is wasted, but it's wasted largely from our refrigerators because we buy more than we need and then we throw it away. In the developing world, which is where I come from, I come from India, 30% of all produce in India is wasted because we simply don't have good storage, logistics, and distribution systems to get to people what is produced. So 
The problem, therefore, of hunger, of undernutrition, of malnutrition, is something that concerns all of us, because directly or indirectly, we are impacted by it. So what I would like to do is uh, paint, uh, as best as I possibly can in a short period of time, the magnitude of the challenge, so that for the rest of the day, as we deliberate on possible solutions where marine products is clearly, clearly, um, and uh, a wealth of a resource in addressing some of these problems. So um, I talked a little bit about this earlier. So I am making a provocative statement which says our global food system is broken. And the reason why I believe it is a provocative statement is, on the one hand, science and technology has made tremendous progress. All possible answers to most of the problems are known somewhere in the world. And yet, we live at this time in a world where, uh, as I said earlier, 800 million people sleep hungry every night. There are over 160 million children who are stunted somewhere in the world. We are facing an unprecedented obesity crisis, which is, you know, which uh, Your Royal Highness referred to in terms of you know, the processed foods and the lifestyles we have. And it really is a combination of the food we consume and the lifestyle we have. As a result of which, and if you superimpose on that the effects of climate change, a lot of people have come to the conclusion that our global food system is broken and therefore needs to be addressed on an urgent basis. The FAO, in its latest report, has talked about this and has talked about the importance of harnessing the knowledge we have, the resources we have, to address one of the most fundamental problems in the world, which is the right of every human being to not just food, but also nutrition. The thing about nutrition is that it's not just a social issue or the fact that we need to deal with it only on compassionate grounds. Of course, that is the starting point. The important thing is that actually, the world loses, and this is a World Bank estimate, anywhere close to 2 to 3% of its global GDP on account of low productivity, where the underlying cause is undernutrition or malnutrition. So if you look at a lot of the developing countries, you know, typically the thing is that, you know, people in the factories there or people in the agricultural fields are not as productive as their counterparts elsewhere. The reason for that is actually related to nutrition. Um, you know, if basically I am anemic, I cannot work with the same energy as somebody who is not. So I think if we take away from this the fact that you know, three out of seven billion people is a very large number who are malnourished. Um, the fact that 800 million people sleep hungry every night. We therefore are confronted with the enormity and the magnitude of the challenge. And I think that is one reason which is what makes this challenge really worth it. It makes it exciting from the point of view of the fact that if we can be a solution to the world's problems, that is a very good purpose to be involved with. I talked about this. Um, the fact also is, it doesn't matter whether you are a developed country, a country with a high GDP, or a developing country. Malnutrition, in terms of its double burden, impacts every country. The 1.9 billion people in the world who are currently suffering from obesity and overweight happen to live in the developed world. You know, lots of, you know, and it's not just the developed world, but it is also a large number of countries like India, for example, like the Philippines, where you've got both people who don't have enough to eat as well as people who are obese and actually suffering, therefore, from a lot of lifestyle uh, conditions like um, uh, you know, high blood pressure and diabetes and so on. And the other way of looking at the same data 
is to say that the world actually is spending a disproportionate amount of its resources to treat some of these lifestyle uh, conditions. So it's a crazy situation where we don't have enough to eat, where some people are eating a lot more calories than they should and eating the wrong kind of calories. And from a healthcare point of view, we are spending a large proportion of the world's resources on addressing their issues. So the double burden is, you know, when malnutrition or micronutrient deficiency occurs either in the same population, the same household, or the same individual. So the economic and health cost, again, something which I had referred to earlier, is about estimated to be $2 trillion or about 3% of the world's GDP. It therefore is a serious global challenge. Uh, some of you would probably recall that in the 2012 uh, Copenhagen consensus, malnutrition or resources against malnutrition was voted as the number one most significant issue that the world had to deal with. And the results from a dollar spent on malnutrition or undernutrition was seen to generate a benefit larger than any of the other issues. Malnutrition also featured in the, in the Copenhagen consensus a few years earlier as the number two or three issue, more important than climate change in 2012, as an example. There is another landmark piece of work that originated in 2008 when The Lancet, for the first time, published an extensive report that over a period of many years of data and analysis of data, actually established that the nutrition levels in the first thousand days of our life, which is from conception to our second birthdays, are so critical that if an individual is undernourished or malnourished during those thousand days, then your physical development as well as your ability for cognitive development is impaired for life. And that is another reason why all of us should be concerned about the impact of undernutrition and malnutrition. In India, for example, um, it is a big issue. One out of every three children born in India today is born underweight. And therefore, the, the challenge is how do we actually uh, make up for the nutritional needs of so many children around the world that are being born as a result of the mothers being undernourished. So adolescent health or the health of adolescent girls around the world becomes a very, very important issue because their health is a critical factor in determining the health of, uh, you know, th uh, the children that are being born every day. So there is a map that has been created by Gain and Amway to actually look at um, data on obesity. And, um, you know, this actually shows you the color coding is, you know, the number of obese adults in other part in several parts of the world. I'm not sure how clear this is, but the dark uh, the darkest color is where more than 12% of the population in that country is um, actually obese. So you can actually see most of the world is in some form or manner uh, made up of individuals who are obese, uh, diabetic, and therefore unhealthy. And those lifestyle conditions lead to several other complications, as we are all aware of. So this is just a graphic illustration of uh, why healthy diets matter. What I've simply done here is what are the 19 essential micronutrients that are required by everybody. And I think if all of us are convinced or operate from the conviction that everybody in the world is entitled to the right kind of food and the right kind of nutrition, then actually the challenge before us becomes quite clear. So micronutrient deficiencies, for example, are the underlying cause of 3 million child deaths annually. The symptomatic reasons could be diarrhea or tuberculosis or anything else. But the essential underlying reason is, um, you know, 
undernourishment or silent hunger, as it is referred to in, at many times, uh, which is the underlying cause of, uh, the, the, uh, of low indemnity and therefore a higher burden of disease. Two billion people, as I mentioned earlier, have inadequate vitamins and minerals, which actually, if they were adequate, would help in preventing a lot of uh, disease and illness. Protein energy malnutrition, which is actually of particular interest in this seminar, is about 13% of the population in developing countries um, is deficient in terms of protein energy. And poor nutrition around the world is the cause of death of about 50% of children around the world. So good nutrition, especially protein energy nutrition, is significant for, as I said earlier, adolescent girls, pregnant and uh, pregnant women, and therefore for the health not only of themselves, but also for the children that they give birth to. So the Millennium Development Goals had actually stated, the first Millennium Development Goal was to target to half between 1990 and 2015, the proportion of people who suffer from hunger. And actually, there was a lot of effort made by all the countries in the UN that had signed up for this. And the good news really is that most of the countries, not every country, but most countries, actually ended up in meeting the Millennium Development Goals. The organization or the initiative as part of the UN that I am a lead member of, which is called Sun or Scaling Up Nutrition, was created about five years ago out of the insight that if some countries continued to do what they were doing, several countries would not meet their MDG goals. So this group really was created, a secretariat was created at the UN, and we worked with about 51 different countries around the world, looking at their nutrition-specific as well as nutrition-sensitive initiatives. One of the things that we learned about nutrition really is that it is very hard to tackle. Um, you know, the first thing about it, unlike HIV AIDS, is that if I'm malnourished, I don't, I don't infect you with my malnourishment. Um, in several instances, you, you, know, you go to countries in Asia, you see um, you know, kids who are not very tall, and certainly in India, we have a saying saying that, you know, Indians are not very tall. Well, that's not the reason. The reason is wasting and stunting, where the underlying cause is undernutrition. So it is very often referred to as hidden hunger because only the people who are undernourished know what they are suffering. And there is, it's not a communicable condition, it's not a communicable disease. And in many, many ways, the people who are impacted by it don't have a voice. And um, I hate to say this, but those who have a voice, um, you know, haven't lent enough of that voice to undernutrition and malnutrition. Um, in a world where we are dealing with so many challenging problems and issues, this is one which needs to be taken seriously. It also needs to be taken seriously because it's not just about giving people enough food or vitamins and minerals. So the nutrition sensitive initiatives, and I was talking earlier with uh, colleagues of yours at Firminish and the work that you're doing on hygiene and sanitation. So the nutrition sensitive initiatives have to include not just access to food, not just access to micronutrients, but also access to primary health care, access to immunization, access to portable water, access to um, uh, hygiene, access to sanitation. And the entire ecosystem needs to actually come together before we can think of a world where we have uh, people who are certainly not hungry and also not um, undernourished or malnourished. So we are still, despite the progress that was made as a part of the MDGs, we are still grappling with a situation where even though the number of people who sleep hungry has come down significantly from about a billion to 800 million, on the other hand, we are seeing the numbers of 
obese people and therefore people with enough calories but malnourished increasing, which really is a lifestyle issue. And it is an issue of making the right choices of the food that we eat. I just wanted to share with you a wonderful example from India. This is the state of Maharashtra, which is one of our largest states in the west of India. And there was work that began in the state. The state is one of the states which was part of uh, the, the, the countries or uh, regions that had signed up for the Scaling Up Nutrition Initiative as part of the UN. And in seven years, what has actually been accomplished is a decline of 10 percentage points from 37% to 27% in stunting. Now, we can look at this statistic in two ways and say, you know, at 27%, it's still one out of three children are stunted. But on the other hand, I think the positive that I take out of something like this is with the right interventions, with the right political will, with the right assembly of stakeholders that are critical to addressing this issue because because the issue is multidimensional and multifaceted, the government alone can't tackle it, the private sector alone can't tackle it, the development sector alone can't tackle it, the policymakers alone can't tackle it, the civil society alone can't tackle it. And this is one of those issues where an alliance or collaborative working amongst all the players becomes essential and critical. Because even if one of the factors is missing, you really don't get the impact. Now, in Maharashtra, there was a lot of work that was done. So, uh, you know, the government went and recruited frontline nutrition staff that actually communicated with people the value of diversity in the food palette, the value of what kind of foods to eat at what points in time. Uh, the nutrition and health missions were set up. The program performance was closely monitored. India has a very large number of um, centers, which are called ICDS, which is part of the government's integrated child development scheme that actually caters to the nutrition needs of children under the age of six. Um, for the six to 14 year olds, there is what is called a midday meal program in schools that feeds 120 million school children every day. But despite all of the effort that has been made for so many years, we're still talking about a population under the age of five where 40% of children are undernourished. 70% uh, of all school-going children still suffer from iron deficiency anemia. And a lot of the work that the private sector is doing together with development agencies is directed at the nutrition needs of children. And the second most important or equally important is adolescent girls. And this is true not just of India. Um, you know, those of us who have traveled to Africa, who have traveled to Latin America, who have traveled to several parts of the US um, would have seen similar uh, conditions in, um, you know, some strata of the population. So this is some data from uh, the World Health Assembly nutrition targets. This was created in 2012. And what is not encouraging about this data is that so far, no country has managed to reverse adult obesity. In fact, on the contrary, adult obesity is increasing. There are only five countries who are on track to meet the global target for reducing anemia. Um, there are six countries who are not on track on any target, despite the fact that these are targets that have been uh, accepted by the countries and, you know, there are some other statistics there. I think the important thing here is we had Millennium Development Goals, we now have the Sustainable Development Goals. Having goals is a very good starting point. But goals in and of themselves, without the right kind of action, without sustainable action, without collaborative working between governments, the private sector, civil society, and the development sector, uh, can yield very little result. 
And I think at forums like this, we should also talk about how does you know, the private sector actually improve its credibility with the government, for example. There are many countries in the world where civil society and the government feels that, you know, the only motivation for the private sector is to make a lot of money and reward themselves. And the private sector feels that government and civil society is not sympathetic. And unless we get into a situation where there is dialogue, where there is dialogue to understand each other's point of view, where there is dialogue where we agree on the ultimate purpose of what we want to uh, address, where there is dialogue which shows where and how progress is to be made, how progress is to be measured, uh, very little can come out of um, well-intentioned goals and objectives. So I think what is very important is forums like this, to have a discussion on how everybody can play a role because I think the issues that we are talking about and the problems that we are dealing with are very significant and therefore cannot be addressed um, in a manner which is unidimensional. One of the things that uh, GAIN does, so it is an alliance. GAIN works with uh, governments. It works with the private sector, interestingly. It has managed to create credibility for itself. So one of the areas is, you know, so it stands for Global Alliance for Improved Nutrition. So the word alliance is truly important because the work that we do really comes out of the collaborative effort, country by country. So I've just given you some examples with the intention that as you take the output from this seminar forward in terms of what to do with the natural resources that are available in the oceans and how we harness the nutrition value of what is in our oceans to a larger purpose. We look at the ability to create partnerships, different types of partnerships that have the ability to take these nutrition-dense foods to those populations who require them the most. So, um, you know, these partnerships are essential to mobilizing resources, to taking products to markets, because very often access becomes an issue. We may have wonderfully nutritious products, but if they don't reach consumers, you know, so the go-to-market strategy becomes... So it's about accessibility, it's about affordability, and it is about ensuring that these populations have a sustained availability of these products available to them, because you know, nutrition and good health is really about sustaining, you know, good food, micronutrients, as well as macronutrients, in addition to the larger ecosystem of good hygiene, sanitation, access to primary health care, etc., which are vital for growth and development. So GAIN has been working a lot in through partnerships. And, um, you know, we track how many people our uh, programs have touched. And since 2005, uh, GAIN, through the programs that it has done with its partners around the world, has actually uh, reached about 900 million people in specifically in the area of improving nutrition in the food that they eat. So these are some examples of work that is being done. Um, it is about, so in Cambodia, for example, uh, very, very good uh, experience with uh, fortification of fish and soy sauce uh, in Cambodia, which actually impacted uh, uh, very positively the nutritional outcomes. A country like China, for example, uh, fortified soy sauce with iron and reduced iron deficiency anemia from 23% to about 4 to 5% uh, where it currently is. In India, the biggest success story we've had is with iodine in salt. Uh, this was made mandatory in uh, the mid-70s. Uh, today, about 95% of the salt that is sold in India is iodized. And, uh, you know, something like a condition like goiter has virtually vanished from the country. So part of the work that we are doing is really to look at mandatory large-scale food fortification. So things like oil with vitamin A and D becomes very critical. Uh, flour with iron and zinc and folic acid becomes very critical. And we have 
enough examples around the world, whether it is a Brazil or a Thailand or India or China or several countries in Africa, where sustained effort in terms of micronutrient fortification in staple foods can really significantly impact nutrition outcomes. So if there is something that we can do from the point of view of marine products, uh, which then become part of people's daily habits. And the beauty when you, uh, when you fortify soy sauce or salt is whether I'm rich or poor, every time I'm eating something and that has that ingredient, it has been fortified with micronutrients. And that essentially is the most cost-effective way of dealing with micronutrient deficiency. And that is the reason why, you know, the... The, the Nobel laureates in the, Glo uh, in the Copenhagen consensus actually looked at the return on a dollar invested in nutrition as being one of the highest. Um, in India, we've, for example, done some work and to fortify with micronutrients, let's say um, a liter of a liquid or a liter of milk or a kilo of, um, uh, of rice or wheat, is actually uh, is about 10 paise. So I don't even know how to convert 10 paise into any currency. Uh, it's, one, it's one sixth of a cent. That is how little it costs to fortify. So the issue really is, with the solutions being known, there was a very large conference that happened in Tanzania in September where a lot of the world work that has been done by various organizations around the world on large-scale food fortification was presented. And what was fascinating was that in every case, the results of that large-scale food fortification in terms of the outcomes and the impact it creates on addressing some of the micronutrient deficiencies is phenomenal. And therefore, we have to sit back and think, why countries who are not doing large-scale food fortification? You know, what is coming in the way? And right now, as we speak, we're working a lot. Uh, I personally am working a lot in India to look at some of these issues. And some of the states are taking decisions. So, for example, we've got some states in the central part of India that have taken a decision on mandatory oil fortification. And uh, over a period of time, uh, that obviously will improve some of the outcomes. So I think large-scale food fortification, whatever role this conference, and I know there are several people who uh, represent the private sector in this audience. Uh, if we can think of a way where whatever we sell can be more, made more healthy by the addition of micronutrients, that at least becomes part of the solution. And therefore, we play a role in um, addressing some of the significant issues that we are confronted with. So this, again, is continuing some of the work. There is a marketplace for nutritious food where GAIN is actually working with farmers in several countries in Africa to ensure that food that is produced is not wasted and some of that healthy food comes to market. Um, investing in sort of the supply chain of several, uh, 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 in several countries. So there was a big initiative, for example, uh, in Bangladesh which employs millions of people in the textile sector that we are all aware of. Um, and there was a huge project which looked at the baseline of the people who worked in the textile sector, and no surprise, they were all significantly anemic, significantly undernourished. A big project was put together on addressing some of their nutrition needs, and again, the outcomes from that were very, very positive. Uh, some of the other programs that um, that operate in schools, for example, is, you know, whether it is a meal in school, which a lot of American schools provide, a lot of schools in India provide, where, um, you know, the main meal is supplemented with, um, uh, you know, with a product, let's say biscuits or cookies that are fortified with micronutrients. And there have been enough scientific studies done in terms of randomized control tiles, baseline, uh, you know, post-intervention, which actually conclusively uh, give very compelling evidence on the efficacy 
or the impact or the bioavailability of micronutrients that have been added to these staple foods. So some of the solutions are known. I think the, uh, the challenge for all of us who represent the private sector and other sectors is how do we take the known solutions and amplify them to reach a wider audience? How do we increase the magnitude of the work that we are doing so that people don't have to wait for solutions that are already available and are tried and tested? So coming to fish, uh, which is what we are here for, uh, it actually is an excellent, excellent uh, source of nutrition. Um, you know, so it is one of those wonderful opportunities like agriculture, where if I'm a fisherman or a fisherwoman, it is a source of wealth, but it also is a source of great health. Um, so aquaculture is probably one of the fastest uh, growing sectors in, if you look at it as food. And actually, sustainable development goal number 14 talks about the promotion of responsible and sustainable fisheries, which is essential to addressing uh, uh, you know, some of the conditions for sustainable development. So um, what is interesting is that, again, out of the 7 billion people that we've been talking about since I began my session, about 3 billion people depend on fish for about 20% of their intake of animal protein. So that is a significant number. Uh, you know, fish increases the ability of the body to absorb uh, iron and zinc, um, you know, better. So uh, people who have fish in their diets are better able to absorb iron and zinc. So there are a lot of very positive things, a lot of very good things associated with the consumption of fish. And therefore, a seminar like this, where you know, so many bright minds have come together to think about the possibilities and avenues of how the resources of the ocean can be, uh, can be garnered to create a better uh, planet for all of us uh, is a very, very important uh, event. So India, again, we've got a huge coastline. And, uh, you know, India produces, uh, uh, provides fishing, provides livelihoods to many, many people in India. Uh, the total fish we produce is about nine and a half million tons, out of which 10% is, uh, is exported. Um, and in India, fish is seen to be one of the fastest ways to address malnutrition. A lot of people believe that India is vegetarian. Actually, that's not true. Um, the entire coastline of India, which I think, if I'm not mistaken, is about 10,000 kilometers, is all about you know, fishing and eating fish. And yet we are talking about a country where we are still dealing with significant amounts of undernutrition and malnutrition. So I think if we begin to look at resources of the ocean, of the earth, as the total resources available, when applied to the total knowledge that we have about hunger and nutrition, I do believe we are standing on the cusp of making some very, very significant progress and very significant change if only all of us were to collaborate um, towards the same purpose and uh, you know, establish credibility in the work that the private sector, the government, and the development agencies are doing, and not look at each other with suspicion. I think that's the most important thing. If the purpose is clear, if what we want to achieve is clear, then I do believe there is a way of creating uh, dialogue and creating programs and creating sustainable initiatives that will enable us to address the big problem that we're dealing with. So I just want to conclude with uh, a few comments. I think, as I said earlier, we are on the cusp of some very significant change. The sustainable development goals, which have come out of the experience that the world had with the Millennium Development Goals, and therefore are far more granular, they are far more specific, and if all countries are committed to finding ways and means of addressing those SDGs, I do believe that is a very positive development. 
Every country has signed up to these goals, and I do believe uh, most countries will be serious about creating plans to address these goals, because the challenges are increasing. Um, you know, climate change is having an impact on agriculture and therefore indirectly on nutrition in ways that the world is still trying to understand. I am no expert on climate change, but uh, I do know there is enough dialogue, enough discussion that is happening around the impact of uh, climate change on agriculture and agricultural produce. Uh, so to end malnutrition, this is something that I have uh, spoken about. We require all kinds of partnerships. I think if the purpose is clear, if the end goal is clear, if we accept our current reality, and if we have a vision of the future world that we want to create for our children and their children, then I think this is as good a time as any other to begin to work and operate differently. Fish is a very important ingredient of this entire issue of addressing malnutrition and undernutrition. And therefore, a stewardship and sustainability of the significant issues that impact the fisheries are critical to uh, the SDG goals and their impact on food and nutrition. I think whilst there are many known interventions on undernutrition and malnutrition, uh, with scientific minds, with the progress that we are seeing in industry, and with access to new information and new technology, I do believe, on the one hand, we have to do more of that which we know works, and on the other hand, continue the scientific quest and improve the technical knowledge which says, can we continually look at improving the solutions that we've got or making them more effective and more efficacious. So with that, I'm going to end uh, my talk and I'd be very happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much.